Good morning. I'll ask that someone close that back door. I'll ask that everyone grab their seat. All right. As people move to their seats, I want to say welcome to everyone on Good Friday. Welcome, church. Uh, welcome also to those on YouTube. And uh, I'm going to ask Bill to close those back doors or someone to close those back doors for me. Thank you. And uh, good to be here this morning. I only want to make one announcement, and that is men's breakfast tomorrow. Men's breakfast tomorrow. And uh, we got a, a lot of men signed up. And if you haven't signed up, why not sign up and come out? Men's breakfast tomorrow. A great time for the guys to get together, have a good meal, a little bit of the word shared, and have some good fellowship. Good Friday. When I think of Good Friday, I think of a nasty thing. When I think of Good Friday, I think of a nasty thing. You know what I think of? I think of death. And I was thinking about it the last couple of days, and I was thinking, there's not one nice thing about death. Not one nice thing. I thought about losing my mother, and I remember when my mom passed away, I cried a lot. I was heartbroken. I was devastated, and my whole family was. And uh, death has got nothing nice. But I was thinking this morning when I thought about that, I thought about our Savior. And I thought about Christ dying. There's nothing nice about the Savior of the world dying on that cross. And I thought about His Father in heaven. His Father in heaven looking down and seeing His Son being crucified. And then I thought this. I thought God was watching mankind crucify his son. And his son said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And that's what we see in the world today. We see a world that doesn't realize that they've rejected the Savior of the world. And for us who know the Lord, for us who have received Christ, what a privilege to serve him. It just makes you want to serve your Savior, to have a God that loves us so much that he says, forgive them. That's what God wants to do. He wants to forgive. We have a wonderful Savior, and uh, I'm excited about celebrating what he did for us today. Let's just open up a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you took the ugly road of death of your son so that we could have the road to heaven and that relationship with you. And Father, we love you and we thank you for that. And uh, we love the Lord Jesus and that he would die in our place, take our place on that cross to deliver us from the punishment of sin, outer darkness, separation forever. No, we have instant death, instant glory, and it's all because of Calvary. Father, help us to really focus today on what uh, Stephen Michaels has got to relate to us. Please speak through him. Father, please speak to us through these songs, and uh, we look forward to singing to you, to worship you, and to let you know how much we love you because you loved us so much. Be with us now, we pray. And Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, maybe they think they do, but they really don't. Or maybe there's someone who's not living for you. Maybe they forgot what you've done for them. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them and uh, renew their faith, Lord. Reveal the truth again to them, Lord. Speak to them. And Father, we think of Gil in the hospital, and we pray, Lord, you just... Encourage him today. Help him to think on what you've done for him and how much you love him. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, I'm going to have everyone stand with us this morning. <clears throat> and we are going to lift our voices to the Lord together. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. saying the old rugged cross, so we're going to bring out a fun one that we all love. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dear
We're going to finish off our praise time together with At the Cross. We have a cross theme going today in case you couldn't tell.
can be seated. Good morning to you. This past week, this past Monday, I had the opportunity to support one of our co-workers at the school. His grandson had passed away. He was the victim of the shooting in North Preston. And um, I attended the, the funeral and it was hard as the community came together to pay their respects and to support the family of an 18-year-old who, by all accounts, was a wonderful young man who found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong friends. And he lost his life. But one of the things that struck me at the funeral was that it, it was a very heavy atmosphere and there was much grief. But then someone stood up and said, we need to remember this. And she began to sing the words, I know my Redeemer lives. And in that packed church in North Preston, the atmosphere changed. As those, not everyone, but those who knew the truth of what Christ had accomplished, the death is not that all-consuming thing. And it was, it was a blessing to my soul to see the saints proclaim Christ in the face of such hard times. And we need to remember this ourselves. This is Good Friday, that term, as I've often mentioned, which for many people seems like a, a bit of an oxymoron, how can it be Good Friday when we're going to talk about the greatest miscarriage of human justice in history, yet ironically also the greatest example of perfect justice in all of eternity. What is, we remember on this Good Friday, if you have your Bibles with you or the electronic means to look it up, we are going to read a passage in Mark, Mark starting in chapter 15 at verse 1, and I'm going to read a, an extended passage and then we will look at the message and, and talk about it. But before we read, let's pray. Our Lord and our God, as we've already sung. We gather here today to remember that moment in human history when you, in your perfect faithfulness, in your perfect love, fulfilled your perfect justice on our behalf in real time. Lord, as we read the account as you have recorded it for us, as we reflect upon its massive eternal significance. Lord, I pray that you would be speaking to us, that you would be meeting us exactly where each of us are this morning, that we would hear what we need to hear, and that your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, would be glorified. Lord, as always, we ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear minds to understand, but most of all, hearts to be changed. For your glory in Jesus Christ, amen. Reading in Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 1. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer how many things they have accused you of? 
But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man named Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers They put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! And again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. He said, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who had stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women who were watching from a distance Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, those women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. 
And so Jesus is crucified and he dies. It's important for us as we understand the magnitude of this that we understand a little bit of the concept of what was involved in crucifixion. I've shared this before. Crucifixion was typical of Roman culture in the sense that the Romans did everything with practical perfection. Whether it was creating a road system, whether it was designing a military, whether it was building massive constructions and developing and perfecting concrete, the Romans did everything with practical perfection. As was the same with crucifixion. The Romans wanted a way to deal out death and judgment that would accomplish three purposes. First, that it would bring about excruciating suffering. Second, that it would be the ultimate in humiliation. And third, that it would be completely public. So the Romans, following from the Persians and the Greeks, devised this way and perfected it of executing someone by taking them, usually beating them first, taking them to a public place where they would be stripped naked, contrary to our Christian art, Jesus was nude on the cross because all victims of crucifixion were stripped naked to show that they had no, no power, no self-respect left. He was then laid out on the cross members and his wrists and feet were nailed to them and then it was hoisted up, the end fitted in the ground and you were to hang there. And again, in, in Roman practical perfection, how they understood human physiology as well as they did, they had discovered a way of which you would hang there and conceivably could take up to three days to die. While in a state of constant suffering, publicly displayed for all to see. This is... what Jesus receives. And it is interesting and important to note that this was not the Jewish form of execution. Jews executed by stoning. And there are several occasions where we read in the Gospels where the Jews wanted to stone Jesus, and each time Jesus just walks away from it. Because first, it was not his time, and it was also not the way of which he was going to lay down his life. Because it's so important for us to understand, without getting caught up in the graphicness of, of it, to understand the significance of Christ's death for us. While a person was on the cross, as you would hang there, you would begin to sag. And as you would sag down, the pain spasms coming from the nails in your wrists would cause your diaphragm to contract, pushing air out of your lungs. And you would begin to suffocate. And the only way to rectify that is to then push down on your feet to lift your body up and take the pressure off your arms. And so you do that so that you can breathe, but as soon as you do that, you then stimulate the massive nerve system in your feet that have been impaled, which then sends spasms up your legs, which causes you to collapse again. I state that to you because it is enduring those moments of pushing against the nail in his feet that Jesus lifts up and says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. It's those moments when he pushes up on his feet and he looks to his mother and he cares and provides for his mother's upkeep by assigning one of his disciples to care for her. It is in those moments that he pushes up on his feet in that spasm of pain and turns to the man beside him and says, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise because this is the Lord of glory. 
I mentioned that it is the example of the greatest travesty of human justice, the greatest miscarriage of human justice, because everything that Jesus encounters was illegal in his process. Jesus is arrested at night, and the Jewish council comes together, but not all of them, which was illegal for them to do. They held court at night, which according to the law was illegal for them to do. It was not announced in public, which was illegal for them to do. Then they took him and handed him over to Pilate, which was illegal according to the law for them to do. Pilate says the man has no reason to die. Therefore, he should be set free. But out of political expediency, he sentences him to die anyway. Could you imagine if you received a ticket for something, maybe speeding. Not that that would ever happen. But it was clear that you didn't speed because maybe you've got, you know, some newfangled car that can't go that fast anyway. I remember once driving this really tiny little compact car and somebody said, you know, the speed limit's 100. And I said, you know, 80 is about as good as this one's going to do. And so the judge looked and said, based on all the evidence, you are not guilty of this ticket. Please pay the $300 for the ticket on your way out. We would flip out. But that is, in effect, what happened with Jesus. The judge, Pilate, says, I find no fault in him. He's innocent. Now take him away and execute him. But then we look at the perfect example of justice as Jesus Christ willingly lays down his life. And I want you to think of what was accomplished as he laid down his life, as he is stripped naked on the cross in the ultimate expression of human humiliation and shame, he makes it possible so that those who follow him need never be ashamed again. Because of what Christ accomplished on the cross, no follower of him need ever be ashamed again. Because your sins were paid for on the cross. So when the devil comes to you and says, don't you remember that? And our first thought is to go, oh, right. We look to the cross and go, no. He took that on the cross. And he paid for it. <laughs> And he took it as far away as the east is from the west. And he remembers it no more. So devil, I'm not going to wear that shame. Because Christ paid for it. He bore my shame so that I don't have to. He was crushed by the burden of our iniquities so that we can stand tall in him. And in his salvation, he was nailed, affixed to the cross. And as I said to our students this week, we need to remember the words here as the high priests look at him and say, come down off the cross, save yourself. And they made the statement, he saved others, but he can't save himself. The fact is, could he save himself? Absolutely. As Jesus pointed out to his disciples, do you realize at this moment I could call 12 legions of angels to intervene on my behalf? As I always like to point out to people, it took one angel to bring about the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. It took one angel to exercise God's judgment on the children of Israel when David sinned and thousands passed away. I don't want to think about what 12 legions of angels do. But the fact is, they were there at Jesus' beck and call, but he did not call them. Because he said, this is the reason I've come into the world. He's being nailed to the cross, and while he's being nailed to the cross and experiencing the pain of that as any human being would do because he was fully human, he was also the God of the universe. And the people nailing him to the cross, their hearts were beating because he permitted it 
to be so. You ever think about that? That the people who were mocking him and who were beating him and abusing him, they existed because he, it was in his good pleasure that they did. That he created them and he sustained them while well, they brought on his suffering. So Jesus hung on the cross because, not because he could not save himself, but because he would not save himself. Because in order to save me and to save you, he could not, would not save himself. So he endured the cross so that we don't have to. He took our sin so that we don't have to carry it if we trust it to him. He cried out the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me in that moment of all the God's wrath poured upon him so that you and I, if we put our trust in Christ, need never feel alone ever for all eternity. God will never forsake us because Jesus stood in that moment and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I would never be alone if we put our trust in Christ. That's what makes this the absolutely amazing, incredible, stupendous, painful Good Friday. Because in that moment in time, as Jesus breathed his last, as he pressed down on those nails, and we read in the Gospel of John chapter 19, and he said, it is finished. He sent a shock wave that went all the way back to the foundations of the world and continues on through all eternity. So that every person who has believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is saved, is free, is without shame, is without the burden of sin. I love the picture in Pilgrim's Progress. If you've read it, if you hadn't, you need to read it. Don't watch videos and cartoons. Read it. Where Pilgrim has this burden. It's described as weight on him. And nothing he can do can get rid of this weight. But then he goes and he hears from the evangelist the message of the cross. And he comes to the cross and he says, as soon as he recognizes what Christ has done for him on the cross. And he believes that all of a sudden the burden detaches. And it goes bouncing down Calvary Hill. And he's free of it. I never really appreciated that until I got my first really loaded rucksack. And we were on BMQ, and Fred knows, and we're all loaded up, and then the guy comes over to me, and then the straps for this, and buckles for that, and all this stuff on, and just like, this is just really painful, and he says, now I need to show you one thing. He said, you got a thing right here and right here. And he said, if you were ever in a combat situation, and you need to start moving quick, you grab these, and you tug and when you tug, it pulls a Velcro release and everything drops off. And he said, so try it. So like we're all loaded up with the stuff and we're going along and the guy yells, contact, and grabbed the thing and pulled it. And literally, all of a sudden, this 80 plus pounds just drops to the ground. And it was like, <sighs> Now, of course, then we had to fit it all back and put it all back on again. But I thought in that moment, it was funny because I turned to my fire team partner who was also a padre, and I said, this is just like Pilgrim's Progress. And he went, yes! And everybody else thought we were weird, but it was true. When we come to the cross because of the huge burden that Jesus Christ carried on our behalf on the cross, our burden is lifted at Calvary. But I need to tell you, we have to be careful because we have an adversary, just like with shame, he'll come to us and say, actually, no, you still got some of that burden. Some of that you still have to carry. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I still have to carry some of this. 
Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that past part. I still got to carry that. Oh, that struggle I have. Yeah, I still got to carry that. And we're walking around like this, and we're, then we're talking to people going, Jesus will make your life just amazing. <laughs> and people are looking going, are you sure about that? And that's where we need to look back on a day like this or any day and look back to the cross and go, this was sufficient. Let it go. Let it go. And I need to remind myself of that again and again when I start picking up the past or picking up present things and go, was it big enough? Was he sufficient? And the answer is yes. Because you notice what happened the beautiful picture described here, that the moment that Jesus Christ, naked, beaten on that cross, cried out that it was finished and gave up the ghost there in the city, in God's holy temple, the symbol of God's holiness and righteousness that giant dividing curtain that divided the place where people could go from the most holy place where because of God's holiness, no one could enter. All of a sudden it rips, and I love the description, it rips from the top down. Because you know who tore that? It was no little people at the bottom tugging. It was the Lord of glory going, we don't need this anymore. I'm tearing it open because my son just made you acceptable when you put your trust in him. You want to know if I've accepted what my son just did? I just tore the curtain apart. As I've mentioned before, one of the greatest tragedies is you know that the next day somebody got out a great big needle and mended that curtain back up because they totally missed the point that God had just tore it apart. So this is my encouragement to you today. As you meditate today, as you take time to think about the death of our Lord and Savior, as you think about what he endured for us, realize that everything he endured is so we don't have to carry it. Everything he endured is so that we can have newness of life. And Horatio Spafford's famous words, as he talks about the cross, Oh, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to that cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. If you have put your trust in the finished work of Christ, you bear it no more. All your sins past, all your struggles present, paid for on the cross, When the God of glory sees you, he sees you through his son and he accepted what his son accomplished in the greatest rescue story of human history. And it's my story and it's your story if you put your trust in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you kept your promise the promise you made to Adam and Eve, the promise that you made to Abraham and to his children, the promise that you made to all of us over and over again that you would provide a way. And on this moment in human history, we remember when your son, our Savior Jesus Christ, willingly walked out, laid down his life, was lifted up, crucified, gave up his spirit, but not before he completed everything necessary to pay for our sin. Father, I pray that you would so impress this truth on our minds that we would walk with a joy unspeakable, with a hope that knows no bounds. Lord, that we would Give our shame where it needs to be that we would give it to you, knowing that you've already carried it and paid for it. Lord, that you would have us walk in righteousness and holiness. And Lord, I pray this morning for those who are here who don't know where they stand with you, that today, today as they think about the cross, they would realize that you did this for them. 
that you went to the cross for them because you want them to be forgiven and redeemed, to have new life in you. Lord, that today would be their day. What an awesome, great Friday, this day. And because of what you have done, we can live new lives. Lord, we give this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to have everyone stand with us one more time. And just before we have Stephen Michael send us out, we're going to sing How Great Thou Art together. Oh, Lord, my God.
as we close, as we think of Sunday coming, I'm struck by a little amusing anecdote that someone wrote. He said when Joseph Arimathea returned home after taking Jesus and laying Jesus' body in the tomb, his wife's like, Joseph, what did you do? That, that cost us a fortune. That was a brand new tomb. We just had it made. That was going to be for our, our family. That was going to be for generations. Why did you do that? Why did you give it away? And Joseph's like, it's okay. He just needs it for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead Jesus our Lord, that great shepherd of the sheep, Equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. And we'll see you Sunday. Thank you.